So it's my distinct pleasure to um, introduce um, Chad Ummel, who is my own um, PhD student um, from Rutgers University. Um, his research is in physics and in particular low energy nuclear science. He did his practicum at Los Alamos National Laboratory and um, he is now um, a NNSA fellow. So I'm expecting that in a few years he's going to determine whether or not I get any money from the <laughs> SSA and other academic programs. Um, today he's going to be talking about a topic very dear to my heart, um, measuring the xenon-134 DP gamma reaction with goddess to probe single particle structure of xenon-135. Um, please congratulate um, Chad. Okay, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you, Julie, for the introduction. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about uh, today this measurement of the xenon-134 DP gamma reaction with goddess, uh, the purpose of which is to uh, probe the single particle structure of xenon-135. So to get right into it, um, all atomic nuclei have a binding energy that holds the protons and neutrons together, uh, and they have a characteristic energy level structure. So for example, I've shown here, oxygen 17 and lead 209, uh, which are very different in terms of mass, uh, but they have one very specific thing in common that I'll talk about in a little bit. And as you can see here, they have an energy structure. So for example, oxygen 17 has a ground state here at uh, exactly zero, uh, zero keV in energy. And each of these levels, uh, you know, they have a characteristic energy and they have a spin. So for example, the spin of the oxygen 17 ground state is five, half, five halves, and it has a positive parity. Uh, and then, you know, moving on up, it has a first excited state at 870.8 keV with a spin parity of one half plus. And so the challenge I'd like to pose is, is it theoretically possible to describe the structure using some kind of theoretical formalism? And um, the, you know, most thorough way to do this in principle would be to take an ab initio approach, which is provided that we have strong understandings of the nuclear forces, which I'll denote by the Hamiltonian there, that are experienced by each nucleon in our A nucleon system, we could, in principle, solve the Schrodinger equation for all of those A nucleons. And um, I'll actually highlight that there have been really tremendous advancements in this in recent years in the area of chiral effective field theory. Uh, but nonetheless, expanding this to heavier nuclei is really, really difficult. And for now, we rely on models to describe the structure of heavy nuclei. Uh, what I mean by that is we deliberately use an oversimplified system that ideally reproduces the physical observables of interest. Now, the one I'll talk about today is called the shell model. I'm sorry, this is kind of a blurry figure. I apologize. Uh, but this is borne out of the fact that uh, many observables in atomic nuclei imply a sort of cell structure. So uh, on the bottom here, I have the two neutron separation energy. And on the top is the two proton separation energy for a variety of different isotopes. That's the energy required to either remove two protons or two neutrons from that system. And you can see that separation energy spikes at what we call the magic numbers, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. So it's at those particular magic numbers it becomes very difficult to remove nucleons from that system. So that's, in a sense, a very you know, particularly stable configuration of protons or neutrons. And so if you think back to uh, chemistry, this is very similar to the electron shells in atomic physics, where the Nobel gases have a filled electron shell and they don't like to react and give up or gain any electrons. So if we want to build up this shell structure, uh, we can do so in a mean field approximation. That is, instead of computing each of the individual interactions between all of the protons and neutrons, we instead say that on average they're all experiencing this mean field potential. And the one we like to choose is called the Wood-Saxon potential, which is given by this equation here, and this is uh, what it looks like plotted out. Now we can take that and we can plug that into our uh, 3D Schrodinger equation, and we get this level structure here. Um, depending on the parameters we choose, and I've compared it to the uh, uh, quantum harmonic oscillator on the left. And you can see we get shell gaps at 2, 8, 20, 40, 58, moving on up. And so we actually reproduce the first few magic numbers, but then we start to fall off. And so we need an additional piece. And uh, what uh, Maria Gopert Mayer and Hans Jensen uh, came up with is, again, they looked back to atomic physics, and they included a uh, spin orbit potential of the form L dot S, uh, and this actually won them a Nobel Prize. And uh, it's th what this does is you split your orbitals according to their total angular momentum j, which is, of course, uh, the vector sum of L and S, S always being uh, one half for uh, your neutrons and, and protons. And so if you choose uh, VSO to be negative, 
Um, this 1p orbital, again, I apologize that it's blurry, is split into a 1p3 halves and a 1p1 halves. The uh, orbital with higher angular momentum is pushed downward in energy, and the orbital with lower angular momentum is pushed upward. And the splitting can be so dramatic uh, that, for example, if we look at this 1f orbital here, that's split into a 1f7 halves and a 1f5 halves. The 1f7 halves is pushed down so far in energy that we actually produce a shell gap at uh, 28. So with correct choices for the wood saxon potential parameters and the spin orbit potential parameters, uh, we can reproduce the magic numbers exactly. And so that's the basis of the shell model. So the next, of course, question is, uh, you know, what is the shell model good for? What can we use it for? Well, one application I love to talk about is nuclear astrophysics, or probably the question of how chemical elements are made. Uh, so this is the chart of nuclides. Uh, it's plotting isotopes as a function of neutron number and proton number. Uh, stable isotopes are in black here. Uh, the process I like to talk about most is this indigo arrow here, which, stands, which is the R process. That's the rapid neutron capture process. It's believed to be responsible for the synthesis of about half of all elements heavier than iron. And you'll notice that it's way out in this uh, dark gray region called unexplored territory. That's uh, uh, in light gray are isotopes that at least the time that this figure was made uh, had been studied in the laboratory, at least in some form. Um, so most of these isotopes are in a region uh, that we really can't measure reactions on them. And so instead, uh, we need to make predictions about what those reaction rates might be. Similarly, uh, for stockpile stewardship, you again need to know about nuclear reactions on highly unstable isotopes, and you need to be able to make predictions about them in lieu of being able to do measurements on very short-lived uh, radionuclides. So luckily, at least in some regions of the nuclear chart, not all, uh, neutron capture uh, occurs via a mechanism called direct, semi-direct neutron capture, where the neutron is captured. This is a, a level uh, diagram for uh, the final uh, resulting nucleus. Uh, and what you can see is the neutron is captured directly into a discrete single particle state. And because of that, direct semi capture is believed to be the dominant mechanism of a neutron capture on nuclei near shell closures. And it can thus be constrained uh, via measurements of these single particle, uh, actually single neutron properties of these nuclei, or in lieu of that, accurate predictions of what those single neutron structure properties might look like. And luckily, that's what the shell model tells us. So to answer the question of what the shell model is good for, an accurate shell model enhances predictions of nuclear properties uh, that cannot be measured in the laboratory. So of course, these predictions are only as good as our model is accurate. So we need to know when it's correct, and we need to know how to improve it. And so we do that via tests. And a very famous test is that of tin-133, which is one neutron extra um, from the uh, 50 proton and 82 neutron closed shells. So it has 83, ne 83 neutrons, but 50 protons. And what the shell model predicts, if it's valid in this region, which I should note is really highly unstable, here are our stable isotopes here. Uh, if the shell model is valid in this region, then tin-133 should have a purely single neutron structure. It should look like one neutron sitting on top of an inert tin-132 core. And so this experiment was very famously done um, by Kate Jones et al. Uh, in 2010. Um, they used a tin-132 beam impinging on a deuterated polyethylene target, looking specifically on reactions on the deuterium in that target that split the proton and neutron, transferring the neutron onto the tin-132, making tin-133. And then they looked at the outgoing proton, which told them information about how that tin-133 was made. And so they observed four states, a ground state here, and then moving negative and Q values actually moving uh, upward in excitation energy, and three excited states. So the next step was to determine just how single particle-like those states were. And the way they did that is they took the angular distribution of the protons from these DP reactions populating each of these levels in tin-133, and they compared to theoretical predictions of what that angular distribution should look like uh, given that that neutron was occupying a single particle orbital. And so defining a spectroscopic factor, which is a ratio between the experimental and theoretical angular distributions, um, a spectroscopic factor of one for all of these states indicates a purely single neutron-like structure. And so what they found is indeed uh, within error, um, all of those four levels um, had a spectroscopic factor of one, and therefore uh, 10133 um, very well exhibited the uh, pure single neutron structure uh, that was predicted by the shell model. So moving onward, we now of course, we have a very clean system here, just one neutron on top of uh, a doubly magic uh, nucleus here. And we want to move a little bit further from these double shell closures and study something like xenon-135. 
uh, which has four additional protons and two fewer neutrons. So what happens when we move a little bit further from these, uh, these double shell closures? Well, zooming in a little bit, uh, xenon-135, it has a single unpaired neutron lying just below that n equals 82 shell gap, as you can see here. So if we were to excite that neutron, it would have to cross the shell gap, and it would occupy, ideally, in principle, one of these uh, single neutron orbitals here. And so it should have a very characteristic energy and spin structure uh, defined by these orbitals, as predicted by the shell model. So this experiment was performed using an instrument uh, called GODIS, which stands for Gamma Sphere Aruba Dual Detectors for Experimental Structure Studies. Uh, this experiment was performed at uh, the uh, Atlas Accelerator at Argonne National Lab. Uh, so the first part of that equation is uh, the Oak Ridge Rutgers University Barrel Array, or Aruba, so it's an acronym within an acronym. Aruba is a highly position-sensitive array of uh, silicon detectors for detecting charged particles. Um, and so uh, we have basically have two different workhouse porous detector types in this array. We have the Super X3 detectors uh, here, which are resistive strip detectors. And so we can use the relative outputs on either side of each of these four strips on the face of the detector to determine the position of the particle and its energy. And then in the end cap position, we have the annular triple Q5 detectors. And so um, these have very small rings running out along the radius of the detector. And so again, we have a beam, a heavy beam coming in, a xenon-134 beam impinging on a CD2 target, and we're looking for uh, outgoing protons from DP reactions. And of course, we're coupled to gamma sphere, which is a 4 pi array of high-purity germanium detectors for detecting gamma rays. So now I'll show some preliminary results. Uh, the very first thing we always like to look at is the laboratory angle and energy of all of the hits in our silicon detectors, and that's what we get here. Uh, you can see uh, the three most prominent features in this plot are these three lines. That's actually elastic scattering of protons, deuterons, and carbon ions out of the target off the beam. Uh, but then here at higher angles, you can see these curved bands. Uh, those are actually protons coming from DP reactions uh, populating levels in xenon-135. So this very first band is pop protons coming from reactions populating the ground state. And then moving downward in proton energy means we're leaving more energy in our recoil nucleus. So uh, we're actually moving upward in excitation energy. So this next big feature is at about 2,000 keV. So we can uh, recast these uh, events as a function of xenon-135 excitation energy, and that's what we get here. We get uh, the ground state and then that first feature at 2 MeV, and you can see there's some additional structure at well, as well. Uh, this line here, that is the neutron separation energy of xenon-135, so beyond that point, uh, the neutron will actually fall off of the xenon-135 and will be left with excited xenon-134. As I mentioned, the other part of this that's very important is the gamma rays. This is the full gamma ray spectrum from the entire experiment. I've labeled all the most important ones here, um, and we'll go through them one by one. But um, the two we'll leave off are these two lines at 847 and 884 kV. Those are actually gamma rays uh, from decaying xenon-134. Uh, one thing I'll highlight if we compare to the particle spectrum uh, a couple slides ago, the resolution of these gamma rays is significantly better than that of the charged particles, and that will be uh, very, very important for this analysis, as I'll highlight. So we can compare uh, both the excitation energy um, from our reaction protons and the gamma ray energy from the decay of those excited states, and we get this coincidence matrix here. And so what I've shown here, this is a subset of the known uh, xenon-135 level scheme. If I gate on strong gamma ray lines, which are horizontal in this plot, um, I can then project downward on the excitation axis and figure out uh, what levels they're coming from. So for example, this 15-12 keV gamma line is coming from a state at about 20-39 keV. And so I can throw that onto my level scheme. Uh, that state appears to be decaying to this 11 halves minus isomer at about 527 keV. If I gate on a region in excitation energy around um, uh, 2039 keV, I not only see that 1512 keV gamma line, but I see a number of different gamma rays that are coming out in coincidence with that. And so what that means is this 2039 keV uh, level can decay via a number of different gamma cascade pathways. Uh, one thing I'll highlight, we also intermediate observe a new intermediate level at 1838 keV that's being populated by this 200 keV gamma ray line and then is decaying uh, by this 1311 kV gamma ray line. Um, so that's a level that we only uh, observe via this uh, intermediate gamma ray decay. We don't observe it populated by the DP reactions, um, but nonetheless. 
Moving onward, uh, there's a strong gamma ray at uh, 2125 keV uh, that appears to be coming from a state at 2416 keV. Indicating on that state, we see again the 2125 keV gamma ray and uh, the 288 keV gamma ray that's coming from that subsequent decay to the ground state. And then we also see a gamma ray at 2418 keV that that is that state decaying directly to ground. Next, we see a gamma ray at 2826 keV that appears to be coming from a state at that energy, would, would thus be decaying directly to ground. Uh, we also see a gamma ray at 1070 keV, which is coming from a state at about 3108 keV, which must be decaying to this 2039 keV state. And therefore, if we gate on that excitation energy, I not only see the 1070 keV gamma ray, but I see all the gamma rays that are coming from the decay, uh, that subsequent decay of that 2039 keV state. And then finally, we also see a pretty strong line at 1449 keV that appears to be coming from a state at about 3488 keV. So again, a similar situation where we're in intermediate populating this 2039 keV state via decay. So if we look at that excitation, excitation energy, we see all the gamma rays that are coming from that cascade. So we built up this level scheme. And um, I want to show this. I've uh, plotted uh, the uh, particle spectra uh, for those levels on top of my excitation energy spectrum. And I, wanna, I did this to highlight just how important uh, the gamma rays are in this analysis. Um, so you can see, for example, if we look at uh, this 2826 kV state in red and the 3108 kV state in green, um, they overlap almost entirely. And so using just the charged particles alone, it'd be entirely impossible to separate out that red state. So we need the gamma rays to actually do this analysis. Um, so they're very important. So the next step is to, uh, again, doing what the uh, 10133 experiment did and uh, compare the angular distributions to uh, theoretical predictions. And so in black are the uh, measured angular distribution points for this first state at 2039 keV. I've compared to uh, angular distribution predictions, uh, assuming population of the 2F7 halves, the 3P3 halves, and the 1H9 halves orbital. And as you can see, it looks most like uh, the 2F7 halves. And so we can assign that a spin parity of 7 halves minus. Now this, uh, this um, 1836 keV state uh, that we observed intermediate via the decay, um, we're going to very tentatively assign that a spin parity of 9 halves minus uh, because it's being populated by a 7 halves minus and it then decays to an 11 halves minus. Uh, the reason for that is gamma rays don't like to carry away more than one unit of angular momentum. So we'll do that. Okay, moving on up, the uh, 2416 keV level uh, looks most like a population of the 3P3 halves orbital. And so we can give that a spin parity of 3 halves minus. The 2826, uh, again, now we're getting uh, fewer data points and larger error bars, but nonetheless, uh, seems to look most like a 3P1 halves population. So we can assign that a spin parity of 1 halves minus. Uh, the 3108, uh, this is a little bit more difficult, but it seems to most closely resemble a 1H9 halves. And the 3488 uh, seems to most look like a population of the 2F5 halves orbital. And so we give that a spin parity of 5 halves minus. And if we look back to the 10132 results, I'll uh, just quickly point out um, that the ordering of our uh, single neutron orbitals that we've uh, observed here is uh, the same as in uh, 10133. So uh, that's pretty remarkable, I think. So to, summar to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that the shell model is a powerful tool for predicting nuclear structure observables. Uh, we've successfully measured the xenon-134 DP gamma xenon-135 reaction with Goddess. And in doing so, we have validated particle gamma coincidences with Goddess, which, as I mentioned, were really crucial for resolving these really closely spaced levels in xenon 135. And we observed the first five states above the n equals 82 shell closure in xenon 135. And spin parities uh, confirm shell model predictions, and spectroscopic factors are hopefully forthcoming. So I uh, need to very quickly thank all of my collaborators. One thing I kind of glossed over is this was actually the commissioning experiment for Goddess. Uh, so this is the very first time we ran this system. And all these folks were doing this uh, blind for the very first time. So I'm very, very grateful to all of them, um, especially uh, Alex LaPelure and Gwen Seymour, who um, started the analysis on this work. And then uh, my advisor, Joe Lee, and uh, Kate Jones, Steve Payne, and Andrew Ratkevich. And uh, there's a nice photo of a few of us at the uh, follow-up campaign that we did in 2019. And of course, I need to thank SSGF, uh, the NNSA, and the Krell Institute for their amazing and unwavering support over the last four years. So with that, I will close, and I'm happy to take any questions.